video of, of this available after the meeting? Or well, it it's being videoed by John Rowland, Constitution.org. John just so happens to live here in Austin. And if you want to, you can obviously see he's taping all of this. So I'm, I'm presuming people can approach John Rowland, am I right? That's right. And uh, make arrangements to get him, get a video. And it'll be on YouTube. You can download it from YouTube. Okay. On their see. computer. Right. How many Texans? <coughs> Welcome to Texas. Winter Texas. Where? Winter Texas. Winter Texas. Fine. You're a Texan. Oh, yeah. uh, I was actually born in Brooklyn, New York, and uh, and by the grace of God and the good sense of my parents, we escaped to Texas in 1975. And I finished high school in Houston, Spring, Texas, actually at Klein High School, uh, which is, was a great place to grow up when I lived there. And I went to work. I went into law enforcement. Never had intended to be a lawyer. And uh, as I, after I got married and started having children and realized, you know, I'm just not going to support a family of any size on what the deputy sheriff makes at that time. You know, now it's a pretty good, pretty good gig. If I'd have retired, I'd been set pretty well. Been there. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, but uh, I had some very uh, close friends who basically talked me into going to law school. I never intended to be a lawyer. So very early in my practice, uh, my wife and I, kind of ran the store and any client that walked in the door if they had money <clears throat> I was going to take their case with two exceptions I don't never have and will never do drug cases and I intended that I would never do tax cases and a man came into my office one day and my wife had just told me 10 minutes before that our mortgage was due the next day and we still didn't have enough money to make pay the mortgage uh, so I had my initial consultation with this man and did everything I could to dissuade him from hiring me, including charging him a, at that time was the biggest retainer fee I ever got, um, to, to co consult him. But he, it, he told me, this isn't really a tax case. He said, I want you to do some legal research for me. And I was living in Kerrville at the time. And I told him, I said, look, you go down to San Antonio, go to St. Mary's Law School and find a law student and pay him 20 bucks an hour and they'll do all this research for you. He said, no, I need a lawyer. So <clears throat> I took his money. And, and he gave me a list of materials to start reading and researching. And after I had exhausted his retainer, um, I had read, read a couple hundred cases, probably uh, uh, tax court decisions, just a volume of materials that he'd given me, and verified the information in the, in the documents he'd given me. And I realized, if this man is going to do the things that he gave me to research, he's going to prison. There's no way around it. And so when he came back for the final consultation to tell him I'd exhausted his money and give him what I had produced and told him this, he said, good, now I know you know how to do legal research. I want to pay you another retainer, and this is what I really want you to research. <laughs> and he laid on my desk a stack of materials about this high of things that when I finished reading them, I was embarrassed that I could ever not just graduate from law school, but got out of college and high school and not known the things that I know now about our tax system and our monetary system and our whole, this, this world of quote unquote justice that we all think we live in. And I was appalled. And so from that time on I decided I can do one of two things. I can ignore this and go on and be a wealthy lawyer or I can start honoring my oath to the Constitution, which by the way at that time I had taken 10 oaths for starting from the Boy Scouts all the way through uh, being a police officer, you name it, I had taken an oath to do it, upholding the Constitution. I had never read the entire Constitution from start to finish until I was already licensed as a lawyer. And I can guarantee you that probably 95% of the lawyers in this country are in the same boat. So if you think the general public is ignorant about law, the body of lawyers are no different. So what I want to talk about today is kind of to, to, to skip back to, to a subject area that's of critical importance to all, everyone in this country right now. You know, we hear about the fiscal cliff, and you, you're, everybody here is, seems to be pretty well versed in our monetary system and the Constitution and tax honesty and all these areas of law that are exactly that, areas of law. But most of the time, when we start our quest down this road to truth, justice, and the American way, we start at the wrong place. If you want to start your understanding of the Internal Revenue Code and tax law with the Internal Revenue Code, you've already lost the battle because there is so much information that you need to master before that point that none of us or many of us never consider. 
and I want to talk about a couple of those issues today. Uh, Tom Selgas, who is my client, my best friend, my colleague, uh, like Larry said, unfortunately had to leave, and we've had a, a, a journey through the legal system uh, with a case that we had just recently submitted to the U.S. Supreme Court, and I want to talk a little bit about that, but, but first I want to step back a little bit and start at the beginning. We all, uh, everybody in here has read the, the Declaration of Independence. Is there anybody here that has not read most, at least, of the Constitution? We, we go back to the Declaration of Independence, that's the, that's the founding document of our organic law. It's the most important document that we have. And none of the other form, uh, uh, versions of organic law, the Northwest, what, Northwest Ordinances, the Articles of Confederation, the Constitution, modify really anything that's in the, the Declaration of Independence. It's, it's kind of the basis of it all. So probably the, everybody can answer this question then. With, uh, with what are we endowed by our Creator? And these certain inalienable rights, Anybody want to recite the three, the three main ones that are? Life, 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 life. liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Exactly. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, when we're born, our Creator endows us with a bank account. The bank account has a form of property in it. And, and we all have that property. And it's the kind of property that without it, we can't pursue, obtain property, protect our liberty, or pursue happiness. Does anybody know what that property is? Labor. It's not, it's not labor uh, directly because labor can be a noun or a verb. This is really only a verb. Time. Time, exactly. So rethinking wealth. What must we possess to pursue <laughs> happiness? Time. Time is our wealth. We all have wealth, no matter who we are, when we're born. Now, when we're born, our, our time's not worth much. And really, it belongs to our parents. Uh, but as we, when we reach the age of majority, unless there's some intervening factor like incarceration or conscription or something else where somebody else controls our time, uh, it's ours and it belongs to us. Time is a noun. Everybody heard the term time flies, time is money, a lawyer's time and talent are stock and trade. Anybody know who, who uh, said that? Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln. Anybody who, who thinks Abraham Lincoln was a good guy? Oh, wow, good. Okay, our time account. We're born with an account of time. Balance is known only to our creator. Time, like money, can be spent or wasted. No time, no life, no property, no pursuits. Ownership of time is the cornerstone of liberty. I'm going to skip forward to... I didn't have time to just pull out the slides I wanted, so i got to kind of go through all these. That's a lot of clicks. Why are you skipping this much? This is all Constitution stuff. I want to get to the property issue so we can get to the money. This would, this would bore most of the people in here. Probably all y'all could lecture me on a lot of this stuff to do with the Constitution. Okay, we, Larry, Larry was talking about and this is a very important point that, uh, that I'm sure everybody got now. He talked about feasting on this material that you, he was giving you about showing you subject to the jurisdiction of the United States. He started me feasting on this stuff a couple years ago, and now I lose sleep over it because I wake up dreaming about uh, subject to the jurisdiction of the United States. Uh, but but ju jurisdiction has to do with whose law applies in, to what particular area of our lives. And, and when it comes to income, is anybody here that does not know the legal definition of income? Profit. Profit. Profit, gain, accession to wealth. You get something that you didn't have before. Uh, does, it, does anybody... Uh, here we go. Okay, does anybody um, make a, ca a mathematical calculation that includes everything that they came in and assign a property uh, type to it and the property value and do some kind of mathematical calculation to determine whether you have a number that equals this thing we call income. And if you do that, have you applied all the proper law? Now what law applies to that? All income, every penny of income results from a transaction, from an exchange. There's no exchange of two things. There's, it's not possible that there's income. 
And if there's an exchange, the income or the, the things that were given have to be of disparate value. One of them has to be worth more than the other, or else when they're traded, there's no profit or gain or accession to wealth. So, can anybody tell me where we, where we would find federal property law? And what, what volume of statutes would we find federal, the federal property code? Does anybody know? How many in here would say there's no such thing as a federal property code? No such thing. Okay. You can't find it because it doesn't exist. How about contract law? Where can we find the federal contract code that applies in the state of Texas? There is no such thing. So tr these exchanges that we do every day in our life that involve property, whose law, when you're here in Texas, whose law are we going to apply to that transaction? Either state or common. Texas, right. Com yeah, but in a lot of cases, it's, it's going to be the state. In most cases, it'll be the state. The same for contracts. Whose contract law do we apply? Do we care what the Uniform Commercial Code says in the state of Texas? <clears throat> We have a, a version of the Uniform Commercial Code here, Texas Business and Commerce Code, which is our version of the Uniform Commercial Code, but that is a state statute. And, and that's part of our uh, body of law that we need to consider when we talk about these transactions. All these areas of, uh, uh, all these federal powers are in some way dependent on state law. Bankruptcy. In a bankruptcy court, the federal courts have jurisdiction over bankruptcy, but the state law controls the ownership of the property that's involved. That's why exemptions apply in, in sta different states to bankruptcy estates. You get to carve out parts of it because the state says, we're protecting that if you go bankrupt. Commerce, intellectual property, employment, all depend on state law even when they're in federal court. Patents is another very good example. Patents is something, that are something that's clearly within federal law However, state property law controls them. Once the patent is granted, it's property. And the state law, where the owner resides, is what controls uh, any transaction in that regard. So Texas law, we have statutes and codes. Property in Texas, knowing your bounty. Does anybody know what that term bounty means? It's everything we own. Every form of property we own is part of our bounty. And that includes rights or access to things that we may not own, but we have some special legal relationship that allows us to use that for our benefit. That's part of our bounty. And that's an important concept. What is property? What's your property? Classes of property. In Texas, we have real property. And we have personal property. Real property is real estate, nothing else. Personal property. Anything that's not real property is personal property. There's two types. Anybody know the two types of personal property? Tangible and intangible. Tangible and intangible, right. Yes, sir? What about private property? The private property has to be a form of either real or personal. The, the private property just means it belongs to, to a private individual rather than to, uh, the, to the public. So this is the uh, Texas Property Tax Code definition of tangible personal property. Tangible personal property means property that can, can be seen, measured, felt, or otherwise perceived by the senses. It also has to have value. Intangible personal property means a claim, interest, other than interest in an intangible property, right, or other thing that has value but that cannot be seen, felt, weighed, measured, or otherwise perceived by the senses. Although its existence may be evidenced by a document. So a patent is an example that would fit into this intangible personal property. The Patent and Trademark Office will issue a patent certificate, and that patent certificate is only evidence of the intangible per personal property of that right to the idea, or, or the invention, or whatever it was that they're granting the patent over. So everybody understand that distinction? Okay, so in that case, uh, tangible personal property is a thing you can own that, can, uh, that you can observe with the senses and it has value. Intangible per personal property, anything you, that has value that you can't perceive with the senses. So where does our time fit in here? 
that, that thing that we've already discussed that, ha that is our property, is it tangible or intangible? Intangible. Can the federal government pass a law that says your time is not your property? No. Can, they, can the, the Secretary of the Treasury come out with a regulation that says your time has no basis in a financial transaction? No. That was one of the things that Tommy Cryer talked about you know, in, his, in his case, about only he used the term labor. The reason I prefer the term time is because <coughs> the government, the IRS specifically, has perverted that term labor. Mm -hmm. And the, the act of laboring, in some cases, could be so theoretically subjected to an excise tax. But our personal time can never be subjected to an excise tax. And if they want to tax it directly, what's their, what's their restriction? Apportionment. Has to be apportioned. So that's, that's very important. So if we don't understand our, the nature of our property, we can't assign a value to that property. Now, if we it's, are exchanging two things. You call me up one day and say, John, I want to hire you to do a will for me, and I'll pay you $250 to do my will. If anybody pays a lawyer $250 uh, to do a will, you need to see a psychologist. And I say, okay, I'll do your will for $250. It'll take me about an hour to draft. Give me your documents. You give me all your documents. I spend an hour drafting your will. You give me $250, and I give you your will. What did I really give you? I gave you one hour of my time. What's the market value of my time? Whatever you say it is. Whatever you're willing to pay for it, and I, that I accept. That's the definition, the short definition under Texas law, and it's also the definition under, under the Internal Revenue Code. I don't think there's a state that deviates from that. You have a willing buyer and a willing seller, they agree to a price, Neither one can take advantage of the other. Uh, you know, you don't know that this is a million dollar Rembrandt, or I don't know it's a million dollar Rembrandt, but you do, and you're gonna you're gonna take pay five bucks for me from it. You know, you may be at a, I may be at a disadvantage, but if it's open transaction arm's length, you make an offer, I accept it, we do our exchange, I give you my time, you give me my money. How much gain have I made on that transaction? Zero. Zero. Can I get my time back? No. no. It's gone forever. Just like if I, if you want, we had exchanged just cash or a car or anything else. So now apply that to the sale of any other, any other property. If I, if I buy a car today for $500 and I turn around tomorrow and sell it for $500, did I make a profit? No. Do I have to put that on a return and send it to the government and say I got 500 bucks, I didn't make a profit, but I'm reporting to you that I got 500 bucks? And our time is no different. But to do that, I had to understand what my property was, what its market value was, and then apply Texas law, do a mathematical calculation. I did, gave you one hour of my time. You gave me $250. My time is worth $250. So $250 minus $250 is zero. At that point in time, do I have any money to report on the tax return? No. And, and so I'm now already eliminated. If that's the only thing I'm, I got that year, the only receipts I had, I would have no duty to file any kind of return, even under the IRS's con convoluted thinking. Yes? Does that matter if you're corporate status or non-corporate status either? No, corporations own property. Corporations have, except for uh, the right against self-incrimination, a corporation can't take the, you know, plead the Fifth Amendment. Um, a corporation has the same rights as an individual in the state of Texas. There may be some states that have limited that, but when a corporation, when a state recognizes that a corporation, a corporation exists, they've given them the privilege of being a, an artificial person. And there are a lot of other areas of law, but property ownership goes the same way. A corporation can own property just like an individual. The federal government calculates, and you, you can get these numbers online, their human capital. What's their human capital? That's all the time they're buying from the federal employees. And so that term human, human capital is the, time, the property that the artificial corporate body has obtained from individuals, and they <coughs> paid them so it doesn't belong to them anymore. If you're a federal employee 
and you're getting a salary for your 40-hour work week, your time belongs to the federal government, and that's part of their human capital. And then they have to allocate, allocate where that's going to go. And it works the same way in our lives. So it's the same concepts, but we all live in this world of these terms. Everybody knows on April 15th you have to take a specific form, fill it out, and mail it to the, to the federal government. But everybody doesn't know that because they didn't consider everything they needed to know beforehand. Now, in our, in our world, our financial world, what is the unit of measure of money in the United States? 371 and 4 grand or so. That's not the unit, that's the equivalent. What's the, what, do we, what do we call, how is our, how is our money denominated? Dollars. Dollars, okay. And, except for Larry, does ever, anybody know the definition of a dollar? Okay. We're going to go through that. What's a dollar? What's a Federal Reserve note? You, we've heard the talks about Federal that. Federal Reserve note is a Confederate currency, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> equivalent. Okay, so what's a dollar? A dollar is a standard unit of measurement of money, and it equals 371 and a quarter grains of, mint, of silver minted into a coin. Nothing else is a dollar. So if we say dollar, we should mean dollars. Just like saying apples, I want an apple and someone gives you an orange. I want a dollar and you give me a Federal Reserve note. You didn't give me the same thing. And, and so we've gotten so used to this world of thinking that the Federal Reserve note's a dollar, nobody knows this anymore. But this is something that's, that's enshrined in the Constitution. The dollar appears in two places in the Constitution, and we're going to talk about that. But right now, as a measure of time, as a measure of, uh, pro of, of value, we use a dollar just like time. There's 24 hours in a day, seven days equals a week. Does eight days equal a week? No. Could Congress pass a law and say eight days equals a week? No. no. A year is 365 days and a quarter, on, you know, for, so for leap year. What would happen if Congress could make a law and say that from now on, a year was equal to 3,500 days? It's not. What if they said that? How long would we be stuck with the current administration? <laughs> it's an absurdity. You know, you ask even you know, anybody that doesn't, is not concerned about the issues that we are, would say, of course, they could never do that. Wait, 16 ounces equals a pound, uh, 2,000 pounds equals a ton, an inch equals a foot. Three yards or three feet equals a yard. A dollar equals three. A coin minted coin containing 371 and quarter grains of fine silver. Now, if that's a dollar, can it change its value really? Does that hunk of silver ever change? That little silver coin, does it ever change its value? But what if uh, in the in, when was the last year we had uh, silver certificates? 60. When did you redeem? 63. 63. You can exchange a silver certificate, one dollar note, for one dollar, one silver dollar. Can you do that today? No. How many, how many federal, one dollar Federal Reserve notes do you have to give for a one dollar, one dollar silver dollar? That's a lot. But the silver didn't change value, so what does that mean? The paper money went down. And if we can't use the constitutional standard of the dollar to protect our wealth, we have nothing. You know, Larry showed you examples earlier of how through our credit system the banks get richer and we get poorer. It's because we're all saving paper money. Well, hopefully we're not all. And it's losing its, val it's losing its value. So we can buy less and more and more people are relying on credit and that just compounds the problem. Okay, so the dollar of the Constitution. We talked about the places where the dollar appears. Con Congress shall have the power to coin money regulate the value thereof and a foreign coin, and fix the, weight, the standards of weights and measures. Do you think it's an accident that the ability to coin money appears in the same clause as <coughs> having the power to fix the standards of weights and measures? Congress knew at that time, everybody knew, that a dollar had to be something fixed. Otherwise, it could be manipulated, and we would never have control of our finances or wealth. Article 1, Section 9, Clause 1. A tax or duty may be imposed on such, such importation not exceeding the $10 for each per, exceeding $10 for each person. Who knows what that relates to? Importing slaves. Those persons who, according to the Supreme Court, weren't really people, 
had to have it could have a tax lay, uh, levied on them of ten dollars, and the person that would pay that would be the slave owner that was bringing them into the state. Do you think those slave owners didn't know exactly what ten dollars was, and that they would ever agree to be part of a government where that ten dollars could be multiplied by ten or twenty or thirty at a, at the whim of some banker? Absolutely not. Seventh Amendment. In suits at common law, seventh. We're, I'm sorry? Seventh Amendment. Yeah, seventh, did I say seventh? Mm -hmm. In suits at common law, where the value in controversy shall exceed $20, the right of a jury to reach her auto shall not be preserved. So what's $20 today? And if the controversy exceeds $20 in a civil matter, I have a right to a jury trial. Do you think that the people that were involved in commerce that were going to be litigating business disputes at the time of, of the Constitution did not understand exactly that the $20 was a fixed amount and that they would always know what that fixed amount was? So is, a 20, is $20 at the time of the adoption of the Constitution the same as a $20 Federal Reserve note? No. Absolutely not. Yes, sir. But it says suits and common law. We right. don't have common law suits anymore, do we? We have there are yes, there still are common law causes of action. Unless a state has modified the common law in their jurisdiction, <coughs> then the common law controls. However, so what that meant in that context was simply the civil cases. Correct, civil cases. Administrative. Well, it could be it had to be something over money damage or a suit in equity or something that would apply to the common law. No, not criminal cases. Yeah. But that's non criminal. Not, right. And and then common law would apply, of course, everywhere in Louisiana because they don't follow the common law. <coughs> okay, so uh, this is a quick, this by the way is, is uh, we're giving you the abbreviated version of, of a presentation that some, Tom Selgas developed. And so here he gave kind of a comparison to show how our monetary system, which is totally based on coins, no paper money, you know, the, the founding fathers would, would be horrified to see that we're where we have devolved in the form of this, in the regard to paper money. A cent, which is 46.3 grains of copper, that's a penny, what we call a penny today, times 100 equals 37 and a quarter grains of silver. So the value, monetary value, of that quantity of copper would translate, be, have the same purchasing power as that quantity of silver. And then in regard to the dollar and gold, one dollar of silver would have the equivalent of ten dollars of gold, which was 247.5 grains of gold. Now, the standard is silver, so the dollar is always the base measure. That's the fixed unit. The copper and the gold could be adjusted depending on where the value of those materials would be. So that's why over the years, the composition and the size of the coins could change. So the gold, another reason they started dating them uh, is because for that particular year you could look at that coin and know this is the content of gold for that coin. So you'd know you were making an even trade if you were trading uh, for silver or for any, any property. Remember we always transacted um, or made our financial <coughs> transactions in this money. Is trading money any different than any barter transaction? If I give you ten dollars in Federal Reserve notes for your, you know, your bag of tacos, is that any different than me giving you $10, or I mean, giving you um, a baseball hat, or 10 baseball hats that are worth a dollar each for your bag of tacos? It's the same thing. They're just barter, it's just another kind of barter transaction. All subject to negotiation, which is all controlled by, here in Texas, whose contract law and property law? Texas property and contract law. Uh, the, the dollar was used, it really came from the Spanish dolor, which was a silver coin minted in um, Spain since, uh, I forgot what year they started, oh, it's 19, 1497, and everybody in the world that was doing commerce would have accepted a Spanish dollar for, that's where the pieces of eight term came, they would cut it into pieces uh, to make change, so you could have little bits of silver. So the, well, the way they came up with this uh, 371 and a quarter grains is they took all uh, uh, an assortment of, of dollars then in existence that they had and they assayed them and the average weight of all those coins was 371 and a quarter grains. 
That's where the, the number came from for the dollar. Actually, Thomas Jefferson ordered a bunch of coins to be melted down, separated out, and he's the guy who came up with the exact value. Right, B based on the average. Well, he combined, I think, several hundred coins. Thousand. Yeah. Thousand? Some of it, like right. a thousand, yeah. So it's an average of all those, but right. yeah, that's... So it was very well thought out. You know, we, it's not something that we uh, that they just pulled out of a hat as an arbitrary value. Okay, now uh, there was an early uh, to do about gold confiscation. I remember Roosevelt said, "Oh, Americans can't own gold anymore." The one misconception is that people still believe that gold was seized. There was not a single seizure of gold as a result of the executive order for everybody to turn their gold. About 20% of the people in the U.S. that held gold actually turned it in. The rest of them were smart enough to go bury it in their backyard, because it was certainly illegal for Roosevelt to do that. And they're still digging it up from time to time. Sure, exactly. Now fast forward to, uh, now, so now we, we have stopped, fast forward to Richard Nixon, and we have stopped uh, the redemption of our gold and silver certificates for everybody in the US. So American citizens can't take their gold and silver certificates and go cash them in and get gold and silver back. But the foreign countries could. So Canada and a lot of other countries that had tons of our silver certificates were bringing them in and hauling home gold and silver. And Richard Nixon, illegally but probably prudently, maybe the only illegal act that I think was justified just because what a disaster we would have had stopped any redemption of our silver certificates for anybody. So foreign countries then could not come and take the gold back. That's a very simplified explanation of a very historically uh, interesting period. So now we go fast forward to Ronald Reagan. And Ronald Reagan convened the Gold Commission. Is anybody familiar with the Gold Commission? Ron, Ron Paul was on that commission. They talked about it a lot. Basically, uh, Ronald Reagan had the Gold Commission examine our monetary system. Now this is a letter from uh, Donald Reagan, oops, Donald Reagan, who was the Secretary of Treasury under Reagan, and here's what he said. He's re actually requoting just what Jefferson said. If we determine that a dollar shall be our unit, we must then say with precision what a dollar is. Our founding fathers followed that advice, and in 1792, the dollar was defined as 371 and a quarter grains of silver. From August 19, 1792 until August 1971, the dollar was defined as a precise weight of either gold or silver. Now, there's only one thing wrong with his statement here, and that is that he put an ending date on when this was the dollar definition of the dollar, 1971. It's still the definition of the dollar, and it will be the definition of the dollar until the Constitution's amended. The silver dollar coin guarantees citizens a fixed measure of value. It, is there, I just, when I got to the point that I actually started to consider this, and I told you how frustrated I was that I got through all this education and didn't know this, I thought, how could the entire American public have been fooled by this system? And, and, be, and we, we allowed the government to take it, not the government, really, the bankers mainly, to take advantage of us and steal our wealth from us. You know, my, my Grandfathers and my dad and you know all the men in my life who were very intelligent men uh, who, who knew about business matters and all still fell victim to what we're suffering uh, through today. So as you already know, a, a Federal Reserve note is a private bank note. It's not constitutionally authorized money. Now here's an interesting uh, uh, provision of law. Twelve U.S.C. Section 411, you know, just the red part is the important part. Federal Reserve notes <coughs> shall be redeemed in lawful money on demand at the Treasury Department of the United States or in Washington, D.C., blah, 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 or any Federal Reserve bank. Now, I, Tom and I have actually been to the Federal Reserve in Dallas on, on numerous occasions and attempted to get them to redeem our money, our Federal Reserve notes, for lawful money. The first time that we went, they kicked us out of the building in about 20 seconds. The second time that we went, they laughed at us and then asked us to leave. The third time we went, which we took a bigger crowd of people with us, as we started to walk, they finally invited 
we thought all of us in, but they invited Tom in. And he had a copy of the statute with him, by the way. And he got through the security uh, metal detector, and he grabbed my arm and he said, I'm bringing my lawyer. And the security guard physically pushed his way between us and separated us and said, no, and he said in an audible voice, no lawyers. So Tom disappeared into the bowels of the Dallas Federal Reserve and came out later, later and told us that a vice president of the Federal Reserve Bank in Dallas told him that this statute was from last year and it wasn't valid anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so what does this mean? Shall be redeemed in lawful money on demand. Does that mean that Federal Reserve notes are not lawful money? Or wouldn't they just give you Federal Reserve notes for Federal Reserve notes? And then why would they need this provision of law? So, if Federal Reserve notes are part of our monetary system, they're U.S. currency, and gold eagle coins are part of our monetary system, and they're legal tender, and silver U.S. dollars are legal tender and U.S. currency, and all of the funny money little cheap metal coins that we carry around in our pockets that we exchange every day are also part of our monetary system and legal tender. Do, do they all have equal purchasing power? No. So has the Secretary of the Treasury not violated uh, the law by exchanging our lawful money on demand? Now, the other provision I want to show you, a couple quickly, I only have four minutes. Federal Reserve notes are not dollars. This is from the Treasury's website. Please go to the Treasury website and just read the whole section on legal tender. It's, it's amazing what they've hidden in plain sight. We, we, we have deceived ourselves. They've laid out the truth for us. You know, we have no excuse now. Larry's put all those regulations together. Can you imagine the volume of material that we've never had a, an economic way to review, but now we can? This is very short. They put the truth up here very, very, uh, in very concisely. Federal Reserve, Reserve notes are not redeemable in gold, silver, or any other commodity. The notes have no value for themselves. What? The notes have no value for themselves. What the heck does that mean? Until you spend it on something, and somebody gives you what they're willing to accept it for, it's not worth anything. And then when it is worth something, it's worth what they gave you for it. And what's our standard of measure for that transaction? The dollar is our unit of measure. And what's a dollar? And then what did we trade for what they gave us, even if it's Federal Reserve notes? Are, if someone wires money electronically into your bank, did they give you Federal Reserve notes? No. Did they give you dollars? No. What did they give you? Digits. No. Credit, promise to pay. Something, but not money. And so if we take that number that they gave us, and we assume, because we haven't applied our state law and done that mathematical calculation, and we come up with a number, we're stealing from ourselves. A Marigold case, that's a very important case for monetary uh, issues. You really should read that. Now, after the Gold Commission report came out, uh, uh, the, uh, sec the commission con tells the, con uh, the uh, president about how bad our system is. Here's their quote. The present monetary arrangement of the United States are unconstitutional, even anti-constitutional from top to bottom. Now remember, at this point in time, we have no gold and silver coins as legal tender in the U.S. Within six months of the Gold Commission report, legislature reinstates silver, lawful silver dollar money followed by gold money in 1985. That's currently the only lawful money we have. U.S. gold eagles, U.S. the silver eagle, and the buffalo, uh, I forgot what denomination that is, there's a gold buffalo coin. That's it. That's our lawful money. That's what we're supposed to get when we go to the U.S. Treasury or the Federal Reserve Bank to exchange our, our lawful money. And they won't do it. Uh, this is... You got time to go through the eggs? Yeah, this okay. is good. Can you, can you bring suit against them? Uh, yeah. No. Well, you could, but it wouldn't get anywhere. You, you have to, you know, the problem, and in, in, uh, who said stay out of court? Oh, Richard said that, Sheriff Manning. Well, yes, real quick, uh, and you may not be familiar with it, uh, North Dakota does not have a Federal Reserve banking system. Correct. Well, some of the banks do. They have their own state bank. 
have a state there are there are FDIC banks in North Dakota that are still subject to the whole Federal Reserve System, but they do have a state bank, correct? Right. And so North Dakota has the only legal money, I guess. No, no, that's that's not, not exactly right. But that we, let me talk about that maybe afterwards. But that's okay. a good side issue. Yes, sir. So what you're saying is is that an exchange based on an agreement of acceptance by two people. That's what you're talking about. Yes, and the two people could be natural people. Right. Could be corporate person and you know. I own, you know, ABC janitorial service, and I want to hire you as a janitor, and, and I say, I'm going to hire you, I'm going to, I want to get contract with you to be a janitor for my company, I don't want you, you're not going to be my employee, you're not getting any benefits, I'm going to pay you X dollars an hour for your time, that's all I'm buying is your time, and what I'll do is I'll give you a slip every day and tell you what facility to go clean, and you're on your own, you go clean. And our contract specifically says you're not my employer. I'm not your employer. You're not my employee. Am I your employer then? Can the government come and say we're going to go through your contract, which is valid under Texas law, and say you're my employee and I'm your employer and subject me to some other kind of control? No. Does that fall under uh, being able to openly contract as part of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness? Freedom to contract, as long as it's something lawful. We have absolute freedom to contract. There, there was an <clears throat> article going around on the internet that some time ago said to stamp the back a check saying we have exchanged this something to the effect for lawful money. And that, it's not that's a, I, I can answer that, but that's a, it's going to take me more than 10 minutes. I just really want to, let me just go through this, this old questions for a minute, maybe till the break. I want to go through this because if you're not mad about money now, when, this, when you see this, your blood should be boiling. Because we can't write fast enough. Is this available somewhere? Uh, yes, we can. I can give you a website where this is available. You can download it. Yeah. Okay. This is an actual example from a house from um, Odessa, Texas, in 1957. This specific, this is not a real picture of the house, but this is an actual real estate transaction that Tom researched all the the sales information. 1957. This 1,600 square foot home sold for $13,500. In 1957, all we had was lawful money and certificates representing an actual equal exchange of lawful money. So that would have been $13,500 silver dollars. Legal tender then would have been silver certificates, which would have been $13,500 silver certificates. Now, what if we use something other than money for money? In this case, we're going to use brown eggs. And the reason why Tom picked brown eggs is because he found from this professor at UC California, uh, who's a professor of economics, that for some reason, however he calculated mathematically, brown eggs rate, re, have the least amount of change in their value because of production methods or some convoluted scientific agri... You know, if you went to a and maybe you'd know how to figure it out. I'm, I'm just a lawyer, I don't know. <laughs> but if we could have bought this for brown eggs, $13,500 would have bought 37,700 cartons of brown eggs. So if the seller of that house had a refrigerator big enough and he wanted those eggs, he, could, he would have accepted that amount of brown eggs for that house. Now fast forward to 1982. The same 16,000 square foot home sold for, I'm sorry, 1,600, I'm sorry. So for, well, it didn't sell for lawful money because in 1982 there wasn't any. It sold for, in Federal Reserve note value, $85,400. Federal Reserve note value. How many cartons of brown eggs do you think it would have cost to buy that house in 1982? Same thing. Exactly. $37,700. So. In 1982, did the value of that house change? No. Did the price of brown eggs change? Value of brown eggs? No. Now, go to 2007. We now have legal tender, I mean, uh, lawful money back, silver coins. That house could have been purchased, was purchased for the equivalent of $13,500 in silver dollars. 
37,700 cartons of brown eggs. 175,000 dollars in Federal Reserve notes. How many of you have a mortgage on your house? How many of you keep getting your property tax values moving up and up and up? So what's the net effect of all this? From 1957 when you bought the house to you sell it in 2007. Carton of eggs, if you bought it for a brown eggs, same. No carton of eggs gain, no gain or tax due. Now rules change for your residents now, but you know, assuming there's no exemption for if you're if you're a normal quote unquote filer, typically it wouldn't have been a deduction on your residence as long as you turn it over. But for the purposes of this, that's the math. No gain. Lawful money. Thirteen thousand five hundred dollars in fifty-seven, thirteen thousand five hundred dollars in two thousand seven. No lawful money gain, no tax due. Legal tender value. U.S.